Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 100th episode of the Quacks Podcast. <laughs> Today, I'm going to do something a bit special. Uh, I'm going to summarize the best and the worst episodes of this podcast. I'm going to be talking about the things I've tried that have withstood the test of time and some of the things I've tried which have failed miserably. I'm going to be playing some clips as well from old episodes, which should be a fun walk down memory lane. So let's get started with episode number one and a reminder of what this podcast is all about. Here it is, a clip from one, which is still true today. This is the idea for the podcast. Um, and this idea comes from Nassim Taleb, and he's like this angry Mediterranean uh, who yells at people on Twitter, but he's written some good books, and he wrote this book called Anti-Fragile. Um, and in it, he talks about uh, kind of medical history. And back in the day, uh, there were kind of these two groups uh, loosely segmented. And you kind of remember back in the day, they used to have these things called humors. You know, they had your bile humor, or your yellow humor. And, and these doctors would say, well, you know, you're getting too much fresh air. And so your yellow humor has ascended your blood humor. And basically the conclusion was always that we need to bleed you. That was always the conclusion was bloodletting. Um, so that was one group. And what they really did was they used rationality to come up with a treatment for the body. It was like they had this diagram of how the body worked and they said, okay, one plus one equals two. And so we're going to take your blood. And yeah, I don't know how they came at that. I mean, it was, it was a rational system, but out not... with the old in with the new Is that sort of the, the <laughs> thinking there. <laughs> maybe, maybe, you know, I mean, if you had like too much iron in your blood, it was great. But... Leeches were big tech back then. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All the blood, but none of the, you know, hassle. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, get your hands dirty? Let the leeches do the heavy lifting. So anyway, they were a group. And then there was this other group called the empirics and the empirics were kind of these, they, they were also called quacks. And basically they went from town to town kind of selling their wares, you know. It's like, well, if your manhood isn't good, you need to eat goat testicles. And <laughs> I mean, they had all kinds of wacky stuff. Well, yeah. <laughs> Obviously that's what I do. Um, and so what happened was the empirics were wrong a lot, but they had this thing called optionality, which meant they were always doing experiments. And the downside of those experiments was not that great. And the upside was they would find something that actually worked. And so what ended up happening was rationals would steal the empirics treatments and kind of take them as their own. Mm. Because what these empirics were doing was just a lot of experimentation. They were like, well, because they, they were in front of people and they did not have all the high minded talk that these, you know, university trained uh, rationals had. So they couldn't give you all these like misunderstood mumbo jumbo so that you just said, all right, yeah, just believe me, you know, you must know what you're doing. So right. they kind of had to have something that worked. And so they would, they would, almost stumble upon something that worked. And we actually see this happening today. This is actually happening right now. If you uh, put the natural health food store in the empiric camp and then, you know, mainstream doctors in the rational camp, right now, CBD oil, which is very much a natural health food store thing. Totally. CBD is total. it was born in the natural world. Um, people are coming in when they're addicted to, you know, opiates and all that kind of thing. Everything. Um, and right now what's happening is, so one of the companies we work for is a CBD company, and they said the FDA is super cracking down on anybody who has CBD on their label. And so all the companies are getting CBD off their label. Like the company we work for, they have this CBD oil bar that has like 15 milligrams of CBD in it. And it's a great bar, um, but it says full spectrum hemp. 15 milligrams. It can't say CBD. And the reason mm -hmm. is that just recently, the first drug, CBD derivative, was approved. Oh, wow. And so it's the same thing that's happening. The rationals are taking something from the empirics that worked, that that was battle tested, that people stumbled upon oh, from, from trial and error, and they're kind of taking, because that's what government agencies do, is they, they monopolize <laughs> some word or something like that. Ursurpers. Yeah, and that's different. You know, if you go back to like Lipitor in the 90s, that was almost the other way. Lipitor was from the medical world, and then the natural world was kind of like, well, we can do the same thing with red yeast rice and with thyroid and stuff like that. So it's almost, it's a reverse of that. And it's kind of a throwback to that old um, empirics rational system that is going to literally go on forever. Right. We're always going to have that. And so my idea for this podcast was we would be the empirics. 
we call ourselves the quacks, just like right out the door. Right. You know, we're, we're not trained doctors. Nope. But we're, what we're good at is experimenting <laughs> and reading rat studies and figuring out <laughs> stuff to try. So that philosophy is still what I practice. Uh, this podcast at its root is about experimentation, skin in the game, and finding the truth. And I really enjoy the fact that that philosophy has stayed true through all 100 episodes. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to start with the episodes that I think are the best of the best of this show. Then after those, I will finish up with some episodes and experiments that fell short. So we're going to start with the good and then we're going to end with the bad. The first one I want to highlight are a group of episodes that are very important to me. They're some of my favorite episodes that I've ever done, which are episodes seven through nine about electromagnetic radiation. Now, these episodes detailed my own run-in with smart meters and EMF, and they gave a probable explanation of how EMF affects the body. I went on to explain in the episode how industry influences the studies on EMF, which make the dangers seem non-existent or seem questionable. And looking back on this episode, this was the first time that I shared a personal story about myself. And at the time, I remember my beliefs about EMF just seemed really out there. I was sure people were going to start calling me tinfoil hat man or, you know, some other kind of name. Now, thankfully, that didn't happen, at least not to my face. But since then, COVID and the lockdowns have really woken many people up to just how many lies there are out there in the health food world. I mean, a lot of people get very uh, despondent and hopeless about some of the government overreach and all that fun stuff, but people really are waking up. And so I think there are more people who are coming around to the fact that EMF may be a problem. But when I released these episodes, I felt like I was taking a big leap. So here's a clip from episode seven that I think perfectly describes EMF. So what, what I call EMR is I say that it is insidious in its effect because most people don't notice it and its effects are subtle, but they're cumulative. So there's people who are sensitive sensitive to it like me, but it does affect everybody. And what EMR will do over time is it basically it damages your metabolism and you don't notice it at first. You just kind of become a little bit lazier. Um, yeah. You come home from work and instead of like studying up on some opportunity to get yourself out of that nine to five, you know, you just watch Netflix or right. instead of going out with your friends, I mean, that was a big one for me. I just stopped going out with friends. You know, you just watch YouTube. Yes. Um, you gain weight. It becomes harder to go to the gym. It becomes harder to sleep. Uh, you might lose some weight here and there, but it just becomes harder to keep that weight off. And it, it starts to get to the point where maybe you feel like you can barely eat anything just to stay the same weight and it's all going to your belly. Very weird. Yeah, this is this is what happens to people. Because it's probably affecting your thyroid and other glandular yeah. activity as well. I mean. and, and a lot of times people will tell you, well, you're just getting older, you know, <laughs> which... But you were in your 20s still. I know, right? You shouldn't be... The funny thing is if, if you... This is why it's insidious. It, insidious means that comes on, it's defined in the dictionary as it's developing so gradually as to be well established by before becoming a parent. So you just think you're getting older, oh, I'm just slowing down a little bit, I'm working too hard, I'm stressed a little bit. Right. But people aren't supposed to be pre-diabetic, they're not supposed to go from normal to pre-diabetic within five years. Right. And they're not supposed to be aging that quickly. You know, if you look at our grandparents, uh, many of them were like full of health and health in their fifties and only in their sixties and later is when they really started to slow down. So you're not supposed to be pre-diabetic, lethargic, yeah. lethargic mass, you know, obese in your thirties. Right. Especially if you're not eating very much. Yeah. That's the craziest. Well, and that's the thing is it snowballs. It gets worse and worse and worse. Um, so I know, I mean, I know countless people out there are just getting sicker over time. Um, and they, they have every explanation, but they are not the correct ones. Right. Yeah. I really love that description. Uh, I would put these episodes towards the top contributions I have made to the health food world. Uh, I wasn't the first to have these problems for sure. Uh, but I know that in 40 years, when I look back on my life and the dangers of EMF are well known, I'm going to be able to point to these episodes and say, see, you know, I was, I was waking people up to the truth. I was telling the truth when it was not cool to be told. Uh, and people hopefully led better lives because those episodes existed and they listened to them. And that, that makes me proud. So, um, that's why, that's why I like these episodes so much. I also want to mention episode 80. That is a good addendum to episodes seven through nine. Uh, in 80, I explore which phones have the most and least EMF. That might be helpful as well. 
The next episode I want to talk about is episode 26, and that is the interview with Grant Jenneru. Now, this is the guy who believes that vitamin A is a toxin. This theory made quite the splash in the health food world as some people scratched their heads, some people scoffed and thought it was ridiculous, others tried it, and some people found some really promising results. Now, Grant initially was using this low vitamin A diet to help with an autoimmune disease and a kidney disease problem that he had, both of which he says he was cured from. And after he shared his results, other people started to, started to experiment with the low vitamin A diet. They found it useful for their autoimmune problems, uh, along with a bunch of other problems. So, uh, I tried this diet, and I had some really amazing results. Not only were my blood sugars better, it made my teeth strong and white, my brain health and mood improved. Um, I had some of the first real weight loss that I had had in forever. Now, interestingly enough, the creation of this podcast was only possible from my adoption of a low vitamin A diet. I remember it was like, at the time, this dampener that had been on my brain and just kind of always kept me gloomy and down. It was suddenly lifted and I had all this creativity and I felt happy and energetic and I thought, oh, I need to, I need to start a podcast. I need to do some kind of expression. Uh, so it was just this amazing thing. Now, since then, Grant is still on his low vitamin A diet. I think it's been seven years now. He says that he has no vitamin A deficiency symptoms whatsoever. In fact, he says his health is exceptional. So my verdict on this show and this theory, well, in some ways, I, I think the vitamin A is a toxin theory is the best example of the spirit of this show. Uh, this was an idea that was totally out there. It didn't make sense at all, but it gave results. Uh, it was arrived at simply, and it caused a huge backlash. So, I mean, I mean, at the time, people thought he was nuts, but the ones who were trying it were doing good. Now, do I think this theory is correct? Probably not. <laughs> uh, there are many unexplained occurrences from those who try this diet. Uh, lots of unanswered questions, and... I wouldn't be surprised if years from now it was discovered that vitamin A is not actually a toxin, but maybe it becomes a toxin when you are exposed to these pesticides, or maybe it is a vitamin, but we just need a little bit of it when we're children for growth and don't really need much later on in life. In other words, I think we will learn more about vitamin A in the coming years, which will augment this theory. But in the meantime, uh, the low vitamin A diet definitely works for many people. In fact, I, I still follow it. Um, I eat a good amount of butter every day, which does have some vitamin A, so I'm not super strict about it, but I consider this experiment one of the best experiments I've ever done. So if you want to learn more, episode 26, and then I interviewed Grant again in episode 69. The next episode I want to highlight is number 28, titled Dopamine and Leading a Meaningful Life. Now, this episode had great feedback. Uh, it connected a popular neurotransmitter with how you live your life in a meaningful way. And here's a clip from that episode. For simplicity's sake, what dopamine does in your brain is it increases your perception of a future reward or suffering. Interesting. All right. So this is important because many publications and news outlets, they're going to confuse what dopamine does. They're going to say it's the pleasure hormone. They're going to say it makes you feel good when you do something. Dopamine is what you feel when you can see in the future a reward coming towards you. Whoa. So it's almost like hope a little bit. That's what dopamine really is. It's like hope. Right. Um, it's not the actual satisfaction you feel at getting something you want. So it's the promise. It's the promise. Yeah. Um, dopamine is basically what propels you towards satisfaction and away from suffering. But the actual satisfaction you feel at you know, good foods, good sex, or, you know, all the other pleasurable human things. Right. That's actually a mix of other brain chemicals like um, oxytocin or endorphins, uh, maybe serotonin. Mm -hmm. But that's not, th those other things aren't, those things actually inhibit dopamine. They actually bring it down. Really? Yeah. So, so it's important to kind of get that distinction that dopamine is not satisfying. Okay. It's like propelling. So listening to that episode really does uh, make me miss Brian quite a bit. He was he was a fun co-host, and he really added energy to each episode that, uh, well, the podcast definitely changed after he left. That is for sure. Anyways, that's a good episode. It's well worth a listen to learn more about dopamine, ADHD, uh, cocaine, <laughs> amphetamines, you know, finding meaning in your life. It's got all that stuff. And 
A great addition to this episode is number 37, which is about serotonin. Uh, So dopamine and serotonin have this very tight relationship and understanding both can really open your eyes to how they influence our perception. Uh, That understanding of that relationship for me, it, it definitely has changed things about how I lead my life and where my goals are. So definitely worth listening to. Uh, The next episode I want to cover is number 29, about getting a colonoscopy. Now, what I love about this episode is it shows what you can do if you are willing to deeply research a topic. And it also contains maybe one of Brian's best jokes ever. Here is that clip. That's what colonoscopies are for. They're they're for catching cancers. That's, that's, if I didn't make that clear, that's what they're for. It's not for for pleasure purposes. <laughs> it's no. for actually for looking for polyps. So there's three tests, right? For screenings for colorectal cancer. There's uh, what's called the fecal occult blood test. There's the flexible sigmoidoscopy mm. and then the colonoscopy. So the first test is a stool test and that's where they look for blood. And this is actually a really good test. There's a lot of evidence that this test lowers mortality from colorectal cancer. It's also non-invasive, you know, so there's no real risk involved. I like this. Which is nice. Uh, Now the second test is similar to a colonoscopy. However, the camera they use to view your colon only goes up one side of your colon. So it's much shorter of a view and it doesn't see your whole colon. Now, the evidence for this test is also really good. That so it's it like a semicolon. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, that was good, man. Just You're genius sometimes. Dude, intermittent fasting. <laughs> Get on it, people. Good old Brian. Uh, semicolon. So let me try and explain this, why this is one of my favorite episodes. Every information source is feeding you a narrative of some kind, right? I mean, you're rarely like just reading data. You're always getting some kind of story. And those narratives, sometimes they leave out crucial information. Now, in this episode, I was able to show that colonoscopies, they're very big money for the medical system, billions of dollars. And uh, we were told by news sources and doctors that they are required for people as they get older. The only caveat is there was no evidence for this when they told us that. Uh, There was no evidence that getting a colonoscopy was a test that would somehow overcome the inherent risks there, even though they're very small. Now, later on, they cobbled the studies together showing that colonoscopies could reduce the incidence of colorectal cancer, yada, yada, for people who got them. So they kind of backfilled the justification. But this story is a recurring theme of the medical establishment, and it is the reverse of how it, quote unquote, should work. What they do is they find something that makes a lot of money but isn't too risky. They tell everyone that they need to do it and get the capital S science, the science, uh, to validate the message later. So it goes money, mandate, validation. In theory, it should not work like that. It should work like inspiration, uh, discovery, validation, and then money, then selling it. And not only that, this corrupt process, it ends up being a real double standard because natural therapies get criticized for a lack of evidence, which is true. There's not a lot of money compared to pharmaceuticals going into natural therapies. They'll say, hey, this doesn't have a ton of evidence for it. It needs more study. But if the money is there, if there are dollar signs like in colonoscopies, it gets a very different treatment. And all that isn't even mentioning the validity of those later studies. Like, You think those scientists who are doing that study, you you think they might get leaned on a little bit to get the right finding when billions of dollars are on the line? I mean, you better believe it. So just knowing and understanding this story alone could have informed you about vaccines and COVID and the motivations behind the government response. Um, You know, why is COVID going to last for years and years to come? This story can explain it. Uh, Because in many ways, this is the same story as the colonoscopy stories. Vaccines are big money, get them rolled out, mandated, validate them with studies and data data later on. So same playbook. uh, And it's why this is why this is one of my top episodes. Next up are the antibiotic episodes, which would be number 31 about fluoroquinolones and the special report on antibiotics from number 53. I think many people who are involved with supplements and herbs fall for the natural fallacy, which says that, you know, if something is from nature, it must be good or better than man-made things. And while I think this heuristic is generally good for those who are just learning about natural health, in the long term, drugs and synthetic substances, they can have a very positive impact on your life if you use them properly. Now, in these two episodes, you get both parts of that spectrum. So fluoroquinolones, They continue uh, to have mounting evidence against them. 
and more and more doctors' offices and even pharmacies will refuse to fill prescriptions for uh, Cipro or Levaquin and other fluoroquinolones. These things, they're definitely on their way out, and in 10 years, they will hopefully be relegated to the dustbin of medical history. But sometimes, you can still get prescribed these, so it is worth knowing about these drugs in particular. On the other side of the spectrum are what I found to be the antibiotics with great potential to help chronic conditions. These would be penicillins, uh, tetracyclines, cephalosporins, and the macrolides. Uh, so for example, amoxicillin is a penicillin, keflex, uh, menocycline, erythromycin, azithromycin. These are all different types of those classes of antibiotics. And these all have great potential and lower risk than some of the other antibiotics out there. So I really learned a lot making these two episodes. And the special report I consider to be one of my great contributions to the natural world. I mean, antibiotics usually just get the evil label, like boom, stamp it, evil. Um, in the natural world, they are taboo. But that episode, it gives you a ranking so that if you have to take antibiotics or, you know, maybe you're looking to try antibiotics for some kind of chronic illness, uh, at least you can kind of stick with the safer ones and know where they rank. All right. The next episode is number 42, the dental episode. Now, in that episode, I presented two different protocols to help your teeth. Uh, one of those protocols involved brushing your teeth with soap I did this for a while. Uh, I thought it gave some decent results, but after I went low vitamin A and my teeth really strengthened up, can't say that I noticed it had much benefit over the natural toothpaste. I think I brushed my teeth with soap for like a year. <laughs> it was a long time. The things I do for science. <laughs> so I switched back and forth between the soap and the natural toothpaste for a while. And, and I do think soap, I think it just did a worse job. So uh, I will say from that episode, using Closest and ACT mouthwash, which was the non-soap protocol, uh, those work great. And I, I still do those to this day. So um, that dental episode, hugely popular, very loved by many people. Uh, Brian and I were asked to do more on the subject, but it was hard to find another angle to discuss until the root canal episode, which was number 78. So uh, that one may be worth checking out in conjunction with 42. Next up is Ken Lassison's interview, which is episode 49. Now, this episode was polarizing. Some people liked it. Some didn't find much value in it at all. But personally, I found this episode and being introduced to Ken Lassison's uh, microbiome website to be one of the best effects on my health. I do a microbiome test every two months or so, and I upload that data into his website. Now, the website is buggy. It's complicated. But if you can harness it, it has given me some of the best recommendations I have ever, ever had. Uh, things like trifala, chitosan, wasabi, cranberry, pomegranate, and many more. The wild thing is, though, the website would recommend one or more of these. Uh, I would get on them. And I'd feel great for maybe three weeks to a month, which uh, would be nice, at which point it would stop affecting me. Uh, so then I would do another test. I would get a new microbiome report, and it would give me new recommendations and say, get rid of the old stuff, try this new stuff. So I've gone through this cycle probably six or seven times now where I, I get on some supplements that it recommends. They improve my sleep, my energy improves, my mental ability improves. Uh, sometimes I get fitter and stronger, and then they stop, they plateau out. I do a new test. They say, get rid of those old things, try these new things. And it just, it's like slowly moving my microbiome in the right direction, getting more you know, progress and then hitting a plateau, then progress. It's, it's just, it's really cool. Um, and this has really changed how I view health and supplementation in general. I mean, if you think about it, uh, if I react well to Trifala because there is some microbiome problem that it corrects, and then later on, when that imbalance is gone, I don't react well to Trifala because it then makes an imbalance, that changes the entire dynamic of how to think about what supplements to take. To me, the microbiome was the missing link. It was like going from a, a geocentric model of the universe to a heliocentric model. So uh, the, the geocentric model said the earth was at the center of the universe, and you could make that model work. You know, if you wanted to predict where a planet would be, uh, you had to do all these bizarre equations and account for retrograde movement. It was really hard, but you could manage it. Then Copernicus came along, said, hey, let's put the sun at the center of the universe, and it made just everything so much easier. <laughs> so 
that is kind of what Ken Lassison's site does. It makes sense of why you are reacting to certain things positively or poorly, or why you reacted great to cranberry supplements last year, but now uh, they do nothing. Our gut microbiome is constantly shifting and changing and adapting to the food and the supplements that we take. It's this constant moving target. I mean, I wish it were simpler. Um, I wish... I wish it was just like, yeah, you take this and it does this. Uh, but I just thank God that Ken has this site that, and, and he gives it away for free that at least gives some hints about what to take that might be healthy. So my recommendation is if you have health issues and you are serious about wanting to take the right supplements and eat the right foods, you should be getting microbiome tests done every couple months. Uh, you can get them from Thrive, which is now called Ombre, which is a stupid name change. Uh, but I think they just had a Black Friday deal for $59 for a test kit. So they aren't super expensive. And you know sometimes they're up to 100, sometimes they're down. So I, I tend to buy a few when they're cheap. Um, you can take that data, you can upload it into Ken's website. Um, and if you're serious about this, you're going to need to watch several YouTube videos on how to make Ken's website work for you. But once you get through all that, you will be amazed at the power of this tool. Uh, you'll be amazed at what you can find. And it's just helped me so much. Um, I will say, you know, there probably are conditions out there that the microbiome doesn't really play into that much. So, you know, maybe I'm a, a unique case. I've had symptoms of chronic fatigue, you know, type one diabetes, that's all related to microbiome in a lot of ways. So uh, there are people that maybe, maybe it won't do much for them, but it is a very powerful tool if you are serious about the supplements you take. So uh, that was episode 49. You can also listen to other ep episodes about uh, the microbiome from uh, Chris Campbell, Keith Bell, and Jason Harlech. That would be episodes 60, 67, and 72. Uh, episode 64 details a personal experiment with herbs and antibiotics uh, that I used to change my microbiome, uh, which was very transformative for me, and that has stayed with me ever since. So that's also a good one to listen to as well. All right. The next episode I wish to discuss is 75 about raw meat. <laughs> Here's the clip from that episode. I went down to Sprouts and grabbed myself a grass-fed steak. Uh, I think it was a New York strip. So I took it home. I cut it up into one-inch pieces and put it on a plate. And I just looked at it. Now, these bright little red cubes, they did not look appetizing. Uh, it had a fairly, you know, meaty kind of blood smell, which was not very appealing either. Uh, but I went for it. You know, I took a piece, popped it in my mouth, started chewing. And I, and I kind of had to chew it off to the side of my mouth. You know, I didn't, I didn't let my tongue touch it. It was just too, too much out there. So I just kind of stuck it in the side and chewed it that way. And it tasted like cooked steak does. But basically without the good part, that, that's the best way I can describe it. It was like, oh yeah, this is, this is like steak, but just it doesn't taste good. It kind of had this meaty, bloody taste. So, you know, I ate about four to six ounces of steak and I waited to see what would happen. Um, you know, a lot of the YouTubers had said, my gosh, raw meat, it's on a whole other level. It's going to blow your mind. And after about an hour, my mind was definitely blown. Um, all the things that the YouTubers were saying were, were confirmed. So I started to feel a little high almost. I, I was almost like a little like loopy. Uh, so I went and laid down. Uh, I didn't fall asleep, but I kind of nodded off a little bit. And I was in that place between being asleep and being awake where I could feel my heartbeat throughout my whole body. Uh, you know, it's just like thud, thud, thud. And I had these really strange dreams or visions or something like that. And they were about my past. Uh, they were about things that, you know, I hadn't really thought about in a long time, uh, like old girlfriends, college, uh, camping while I was in college, you know, and it was just, it was kind of strange. Uh, after about an hour and a half of that, I got up and I just felt totally refreshed. Uh, you, you know that feeling where you take just the perfect nap in the afternoon and you just wake up and you just feel clear? Like that that was how I felt. My mind was totally clear. Uh, I was awake, but it was almost like someone had turned off all the thought noise that was in my brain. I was totally present. I didn't have any anxiety about anything. Uh, I didn't have any need to get things done or to work on this or that, you know, 
project or whatever. It, it was almost like before I ate the raw meat that day, I was in the rat race. I was just running furiously on a treadmill, treadmill trying to get things done. And afterwards, I just stepped off. I was I was a new new person. Um, I, I felt incredibly grounded. That's another great word for it, grounded. So yeah, raw meat was a bit of a trip the first time I tried it. Uh, I still eat raw meat to this day, so it has been maybe a year and two months. I've never been sick. Uh, I don't eat it every day anymore. I think when I first started, it was really feeding something that needed to be fed inside me. But after about six months or so of that, I backed off, which felt better. Um, I don't have the cravings for it anymore. You know, when I first started, it was like, oh my gosh, I need this. It was a very strange feeling. It was a, it was a craving like... I don't know, you, you have cravings for chocolate or sugar or fat or something like that. It was a much different craving. It was a deep craving, like somewhere deep inside me, there was a wolf howling and saying, give me more. <laughs> uh, and again, I feel like I've said this a few times already, but this is one of the best experiments and discoveries I have found. Uh, raw meat changed who I am. Before raw meat, I was one person. After it, I was more confident, more present, more driven, um, when I was eating raw meat every day, I felt like a hunter. I felt like this lion on the prowl. It sounds crazy talking about it, but there is a real reason why tribal peoples love and prize raw meat. Uh, the life force from the animal is still present. You haven't cooked it out, and you can add that life force to your life force just as just as nature intended. So, um, Now, I, I should say I did have some side effects from the raw meat. One of my ears got clogged in what I think was oxalate dumping. Uh, I had some constipation and other digestive issues, so there may be some fine-tuning to be done there. It's not just a panacea where you can just get on a bunch of raw meat and you'll be fine. There, you, you definitely need some adjustment, but uh, if you adjust to it, man, it is, it is good stuff. And I So each day I eat about, ha I'm sorry, not each day, but every three days I eat about half a pound of raw steak and raw chicken and never gotten sick. Uh, it's all local too. Chicken's local, beef's local, and if you can if you can manage that, that's definitely the way to do it. Uh, in addition to episode 75, episode 77 is an interview with my friend Weston, who is also a raw meat eater. I've heard a few people say that while my episode intrigued them, Weston was really the one who actually convinced them to try raw meat. And he's been doing it for, uh, I think, four years, he, he, just longer than me, a lot longer than me. So um, he's, he's a great resource. Uh, episode 75 and 77, those are the raw meat episodes. Next up is episode 92 about Dr. Sarno, which only came out earlier this year, but is definitely worth mentioning. Uh, this is a guy who connected suppressed rage with back pain. And here's a clip from that episode. So Dr. Sarno took this model and he found that through our lives, when we don't express our emotions, we deposit them into our unconscious, almost like a bank account. Now, these emotions are coming from the id, so they include desires, angers, and sadness. Uh, these emotions are also coming from pressures by the superego, which is saying, uh, you have to act this way to be a good person, and you made a mistake there, and you need to be better at work, and you know all those kinds of things to try and cajole you into being what is considered a good person in your mind. So you have this suppression bank account that can hold a certain amount of anger, sadness, guilt, and pressure before it fills up and it starts spilling over into our conscious mind because that, that's kind of what the act of suppression is. It's taking something that's trying to come to the forefront into our attention and it's saying, no, 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 push that back into the unconscious. And so we only have a little, uh, you know, a little space, a, a little bank account before we can't suppress anymore. Now, the most intense of these emotions is rage. Now, rage is created if we suppress anger over and over again. It builds up in the unconscious, the id, uh, until it boils so hot that it turns into rage. So you can imagine something bugging you, kind of annoying you, and then something else happens that also bugs you, and then it happens again and again until finally, you know, it isn't frustration you're feeling anymore, but you're just like angry out of your mind. It's that That's rage. Now, when anger turns into rage and starts spilling over into the conscious mind, it becomes very dangerous. Out of all the emotions, so uh, mad, sad, glad, or afraid, those are the main four categories. Out of all of these, 
anger is probably the most dangerous and has the potential to get us killed. Uh, you know, for example, if you are driving and you go into a rage, you can kill someone or you can kill yourself in some road rage accident. And your mind understands this. It gets that rage is some toxic stuff. And so it wants to help. And when the mind sees this rage build up, it looks at the situation and says, you know, this rage is very dangerous. If it blows up, bad things could happen. It's better that I distract myself from this rage than express it. And it does this by causing pain and other symptoms within the body. Uh, and pain works very well as a, as a distraction because physical symptoms can take up our whole attention. Uh, people can become obsessed with their pain and shape their entire life through trying to avoid it. So to the mind, causing pain can be uh, mission accomplished. You know, we did it in, in avoiding the rage. I love Dr. Sarno's work, uh, and I continue to marvel at how well he connected the emotions and the physical symptoms better than any other person I've read about. I mean, I don't have back pain, but I, you know, he was just such a great connection that he was able to find through years of experience. Uh, I believe that if you are trying to heal from something or you have a new ailment, reading his books and applying his model to what you are going through even if it isn't back pain, it's going to be advantageous. Uh, for me, just journaling and asking the question, what am I angry about, and writing for half an hour, I found this to be a fantastic exercise. Uh, I would find out things that I was angry about that I had no idea were bothering me. And afterwards, it was like being free from this load that I was carrying around without even knowing. Uh, I mean, Think about that. You have this load you're carrying around and, and it causes back pain, just like large loads cause. <laughs> so big thumbs up for Dr. Sarno and episode 92. Next up are some runner-up episodes that are good. Uh, they have important topics, but just didn't quite make it to that elite level. Uh, episode 45 about nicotine. This is one of the least listened to episodes. Uh, people hate nicotine. I'm not sure why. Probably all of the terrible press from the 90s. But you know, nicotine gets a bad rap and it can be very useful. I use it for all my quacks interviews and it makes them so much easier and more fun. Uh, so as long as you can kind of keep your use of it to once a week, maybe a little more, a little less, it can be a great tool in your performance arsenal, very low side effects, great brain booster. So all that, uh, episode 54 about lumbrokinase. This is one of the better supplemental enzymes out there uh, that I still take today. I take a lot of it. It's good if you are exposed to mold or have inflammation or, you know, just lots of other things. Episode 56, about MRI dyes with Molly and Dr. Walsh. Very important topic because most people will get an MRI at some point in their lives. I still talk to Molly sometimes and that gadolinium crap, that is just the worst. You, I mean, that is something definitely to be aware of. Episode 61 about how to fix your eyesight with Esther is next. Uh, it may take a while. It may take practice, but if you put in the work, you can fix your eyesight. Uh, next is episode 74 with the legendary Carrie Madej about the new mRNA vaccines. This was my most popular episode ever. I think it got 10,000 views, 12,000 views. Still, It's still climbing, so pretty amazing episode. Uh, we're going to see if she's right or wrong in the next few years. Uh, I know where I would put my money at, but I could be wrong. You never know. Episode 83, about air purifiers. I put a bunch of work into this episode, and I am very proud of how it was laid out and explained in a simple way. Uh, this episode, if you're interested in buying an air purifier, uh, it's going to be a great resource for years to come. Okay, those were, in my opinion, some of the best episodes of the Quacks podcast. Let's talk about some of the experiments and episodes which really did not hold up well over the years. Uh, these are maybe things that were exciting, but which ended up falling on their face in the long term, or maybe supplements that, you know, they worked for a while, but then stopped, or maybe they, you know, they did have a clear benefit, but then the side effects made them not as good. The first thing is uh, CBD from episodes three and five. Now at the time when episode, when these episodes aired, there was a lot of questions around CBD and what it could possibly do. Uh, people were using CBD for digestion, pain, sleep, and a host of other ailments with some very impressive results. Since then, the, CD, the CBD market has completely crashed. Uh, I know this because one of the companies I work for sells CBD and they have had their sales cut in half multiple times since the heydays of uh, 2018 and 2019. Now in that time, I've become less and less positive about CBD. I know some people are going to disagree with me strongly on this, but the shine has rubbed off on CBD. I, I think for short-term use, it's probably okay, uh, and it has some stronger effects, but for long-term use, I think it can have 
a poor effect on the liver. I've talked to a couple people who have used large doses of CBD and they now have like new autoimmune problems. Now, these people are unique in that they were taking hundreds of milligrams. So most people, you know, they probably won't run into this issue. And I think CBD will always have a place in helping people sleep or, or fixing digestive problems at lower doses. But the reality did not quite reach the promise that CBD had, uh, other than in a, in a few specialized areas like seizures. So next is episode 10, which was about boron. Now, boron seems to really help joint pain, and I still recommend it for that. Uh, when I was on it, all my tissues felt more solid and I think it's very good for that in particular, but I also think it raises estrogen and it lowered my kidney function long-term. So there are drawbacks there that I think may be acceptable to some people, but they weren't for me. And it also makes you a horny madman if you take a lot of it. So <laughs> I guess if you need help in the libido department, 12 milligrams of boron would probably do the trick. And it's probably totally acceptable to use in that way as a one-off uh, if you are so inclined. Next is episode 25 about a broccoli extract called sulfurophane. Now this stuff has real promise, but it is very powerful. I, you know, I tried it several times. I don't think on balance it was good in the long term. Uh, there were short-term benefits, but I was not really able to make it work. Now this was before I knew about the microbiome, so I was kind of shooting in the blind with this stuff. Next is episode 51 about kava kava and the local Kava Kava bar here in Phoenix, Arizona. This was a fun episode because me and Brian, we went down to the Kava bar and it was a blast. We hung out um, and it was it was fun. Now, Kava is supposed to be relaxing and it kind of is. It's like being drunk without the dizziness and bad parts, but mostly it just made my tongue numb and was kind of a cool novelty and cost me a lot of money. So, eh. <laughs> uh, next is episode 81 about lifespan and NAD boosters. Now, this episode was a review of the book written by life extension expert David Sinclair and all of his recommendations on how you can extend lifespan. The NAD supplements that he talked about didn't work for me, but maybe there is promise there. The NAD infusions, on the other hand, were quite awesome. <laughs> they were super expensive but are some of the best brain boosting experiences that I have had. So I would do this. And for maybe three days after an infusion, I had perfect recall. I was fast. I was clever. I was funny. Every word was at the tip of my tongue. It was great. So an NAD IV, I think it's a great way to show you what kind of potential your brain has, but you do pay for it. Stuff is, is definitely not cheap. Next up is a episode 85. Uh, which was titled The Weight Loss Supplement That Also Helps You Sleep. Now, this was about Chittisan. Now, Chittisan has to be one of the best supplements I've ever taken that completely stopped working after about two months. I mean, this thing made me sleep amazingly. It gave me vivid dreams. It gave me energy to work out during the day. And I lost like five pounds on it. I was blown away at how well it was working. But it stopped working around a month and a half in. Uh, it stopped helping me sleep. It just did nothing. I didn't feel bad, but just nothing seemed to be happening. However, under the surface, something was happening. It swung my microbiome from a healthy balance between Firmicutes, Bactroides, and Protobacteria to a massive imbalance with very high Bactroides and Proteobacteria. And this took me, I don't know, maybe four months to undo. So this episode, the Chittisan one, it came out in May. I took Chittisan for a couple, so, so maybe until like July. And just recently in October, my microbiome was back to a semblance of balance. Now, this wasn't a bad experience for me. I didn't feel bad, but from what Jason Harlick says about a healthy microbiome and the fact that uh, Firmicutes don't have lipopolysaccharide and proteobacteria and Bactroides have a lot of lipopolysaccharide, so that's endotoxin, I know that I was in kind of dangerous territory. So I don't know, may, you know, maybe the way to take this stuff is to take it for a few weeks every three to six months or something. I'm not sure, but if Chittisan shows up in my microbiome recommendation again, I will definitely approach it differently. Uh, maybe I'm going to pulse it or something like that. Next up is episode 89 about grounding with Clint Ober. Now, this episode and topic had so much promise. The way he explained inflammation and how helpful grounding could be, um, it was just, man, it was so convincing. But sadly, it just didn't work great for me and others that I know who tried it. And in particular, it was the grounding mats and bracelets and sheets that I think didn't work that well. Uh, going outside and walking around barefoot to ground yourself is actually pretty great. And no one I've seen or talked to who does that has ever reported bad effects. The problem seems to come in when you get a grounding pad and you plug it into the grounding hole in an outlet. So, you know, at first this was great. 
I had a grounding mat at my computer. I had a grounding sheet on my bed. It relaxed me. It helped me sleep. Also seemed to lower water retention. Uh, Maybe it helped me lose weight. I'm not sure. But after about a month, it started doing the opposite. It started to stimulate me. Um, I had trouble sleeping on the grounding mat. And today, I don't use grounding at all. Um, Perhaps there is some way to use the mats effectively, but I personally think the best bet if you want these benefits of grounding is to get your bare feet or your body in the grass and dirt and do it that way. Uh, I actually asked Clint in the interview if the mats were different than just going outside and walking around barefoot. And he said, no, they're the exact same. Got to say, my experience says otherwise. Still, a fun episode to listen to for Clint's experience and how he discovered grounding. Okay, so that's it. Now, I know there are some great episodes I didn't mention. I didn't talk about Mutaflor or Turkey Tail. Um, I also didn't mention all the supplements I've talked about that you know did okay in narrow ways but weren't generally useful, uh, like Vitex, Holy Basil, L-theanine. Uh, so some were left out, and I'm sure there are some favorites out there that didn't get mentioned, but these, impa- uh, these episodes were the most impactful in my opinion. And I want to end here with some thoughts. The first episode of the podcast was, was released on February 18th, 2019. So it is coming up on the three-year anniversary, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> you know, I'm totally proud of the energy that I have put into this podcast and the information that I have discovered and spread. Um, I've met some amazing people. And the show has been really crucial in turning my own health around. When I started this podcast, I was maybe 20 pounds heavier with way more health challenges than I have now. And I've learned the lesson that, you know, if you really want to solve a problem or become adept at something, you can't do it by just reading and following other people. Uh, You have to go out into the proverbial wilderness and see what treasure you can bring back. Uh, I tested things I would never have touched if it were not for this podcast. Great example of that is ivermectin, which, um, you know, I've been testing it out more since episode 94, and I I really like it for some general health things. I never would have, I never would have tried it if it wasn't to discover, you know, how I reacted to it and, and put it out there. Same for raw meat, same for the microbiome stuff. These were areas where I looked for information and it was scant to nothing. And I had to say, okay, you know, am I going to risk it and find out if there is a reward here? And sometimes I didn't make the right decision. I mean, I didn't mention many of my failures on this podcast unless they were particularly interesting, but I spent money on herbs and other supplements that did nothing for me or hurt me. Um, And I just had to take the L and move on. Now I'm happy to take those losses because I have discovered things like raw meat, like ivermectin, like microbiome reports, like lumbrokinase, and my life is immeasurably better because of these things. So I've made a decision to take a break for maybe a quarter or two from the podcast, so maybe three to six months. Um, As I was putting this episode together, I noticed how much more enthusiastic I was when I first started making episodes, and this makes sense. At the time, I was not feeling great compared to where I am now. I was researching constantly, And having a way to put that research out there in an organized and entertaining fashion was really good. It was a good practice. It was, you know, I liked doing it. I enjoyed it. But these days, I am not researching much. Uh, I'm not motivated to research much either. I I feel pretty great. (laughs) So I don't have this internal fire to find out what is going on with my body. These days, I'm out walking, rowing, uh, burpees, camping. Uh, I'm going on tons of dates and meeting new people. I mean, I have different groups and friends that I meet with almost every night of the week, which if you had told me I was doing that a few years ago, I would have paled at how much energy uh, that took. Uh, Recently, I was approved for a mortgage. So, you know, maybe I'll buy a house at some point. Uh, Maybe I'll get more into my faith stuff with Christianity. I don't know. The, The bottom line is my life has opened up so much since I started this podcast. And, uh, I'm just in a different, and I'm in a better place now. And let me tell you, this podcast is a lot of work. (laughs) I probably spend at least 20 to 40 hours per month on it, and that energy could go towards other goals that I have. So this will probably be the last episode for this year, um, and then for three to six months after that as well. I do, I will say I have some interviews lined up, which would mean uh, there's going to be scattered releases here and there. Uh, I do want to find out about the new Alzheimer's drug that just came out a few months ago. So um, don't unsubscribe or anything. <laughs> All right. There's, there'll still be stuff coming, um, mostly interviews, probably, unless, you know, there's some really interesting thing that I find. 
Um, and after a few months, you know, I, I may want to come back and have lots of new stories to share. Uh, maybe I'll do the Dan Carlin approach where I'll just release an episode a few times a year, but just pour tons of research into it. I, I don't know. Or maybe I'll just let this chapter end in my life. Uh, either way, thank you for listening and being so supportive of the show. I appreciate immensely all the emails and questions and feedbacks you guys have given me over the years. Uh, it's just been so awesome. And the friends I have made and the conversations, I mean, I was approached by a lady the other day in a grocery store who I know who just started listening to the podcast and she she was just overflowing with with how good it was. And it, I was just like, wow, this is this is awesome. So I'm definitely not closing the book on the podcast, but I also need to put my energy towards some other real life things. And uh, the podcast is going to have to take a step back for a little while. So feel free to contact me anytime with any health questions that you have, uh, or just really anything. Quackspodcast at gmail.com. You can also uh, find me on Twitter. I'm going to stay active there. So at Quackspod is my handle. Uh, And other than that, it's been an honor. Be well. (laughs) 